Good morning and welcome to Barnabas Christian Church. My name is Sean Lindsay. I'm the associate pastor here at BCC. And we want to welcome you and thank you for choosing to be a part of this with us today. Um, just a couple of announcements before we get started in our service today. I know that you're looking at this Christmas season and wondering if there's anything out there, any events out there that you could be a part of uh, to join in the joy of our Christmas season. And so I just want to let you know of a couple things that we're doing here at BCC, uh, trying to keep everybody safe, but still enjoy Christmas at the same time. So we have decided to head out to Alpha Park next Sunday um, on December the 20th at 6 p.m. Uh, the village has asked that we wear masks, we say distance, but we're going to meet there at 6 p.m. at Alpha Park and we're going to sing Christmas carols there together um, around those lit Christmas trees at Alpha Park. So make sure you join us for that. Also on the 22nd, which is a Tuesday night, uh, Katie Burkle and the special events team have put together a uh, Christmas light scavenger hunt. So if you want to be a part of that, uh, Santa is going to be here at the church out in the parking lot between five and seven that night where you can stop by. Uh, you can take a quick selfie with Santa and get uh, your scavenger hunt list and head out with your family on your own to do that scavenger hunt. Also coming up after the first of the year, just want to highlight something for you. Kevin and I are looking at a Bible study called Rooted. Um, so it's going to be an all church Bible study. We're going to have several different ones open. Uh, most of those will be, well, all of those will be online to start out with. Um, but hopefully as restrictions uh, decrease that we'll be able to meet in person after that. So look for that on Facebook, on our website coming up, place where you can sign up to be part of Rooted with us together. So that's all the announcements I have today. Uh, thanks for worshiping with us and let's worship together this morning.
see, family. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last your troubles will be over and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, Cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid. For the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all of your fears. He will rejoice over you in joyful songs. I will gather you who mourn for the appointed festivals. You will be disgraced no more. And I will deal deal severely with all who have oppressed you. I will save the weak and helpless ones. I will bring together those who were chased away. I will give glory and fame to my former exiles, wherever they have been mocked and shamed. On that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. I will give you a good name, a name of distinction among all the nations of the earth, as I restore your fortunes before their very eyes. I, the Lord, have spoken. incredible gift that you've given us. Help us to remember this during the Christmas season and always. In Jesus' name.
So I saw an ad this week on Yahoo's homepage. Bring joy to the galaxy. How in the world is that possible? Well, it's the 2020 Jedi Master Yoda Hallmark ornament with magic, sound, and motion. Press the button on the ornament and you'll see Yoda move and you'll hear him speak. Well, that sounds fantastic. Batteries aren't included, though. Can this little green plastic ornament really bring joy to the galaxy? Maybe a child, but obviously not everybody else. You know what? I remember when I was younger, erupting with joy when I received that present I was hoping for. I actually got an X-Wing fighter one year for Christmas. Yes, I remember seeing the first Star Wars movie in the movie theaters in the 1970s. Yeah, joy is the trait that we're exploring today. And if you've been journeying with us for the past few weeks, you know that we've been celebrating Advent. And so each week we are focusing on a different attribute of God represented in the coming of Jesus. Hope, peace, joy, and love. And through these traits, we are learning how we can rediscover Christmas. Despite the challenges, even in the midst of our hardships, even the difficulties, that we might be experiencing right now. You see, because Christ has come to us, we can experience joy no matter what discouragement we encounter. And so there's a lot of joy in the biblical Christmas story, especially early in the story. But it's important to note that this joy isn't separate from pain and frustration. And so this is what I want you to know today. Joy can erupt even when we face disappointment. And so we're going to look a little bit more closely at this as we experience the story of Elizabeth and Mary. You see, Luke's Christmas story begins a little earlier than Mary and Joseph and Jesus with a priest named Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth. And so Luke's words in chapter 1 of his Gospel, beginning in verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judah, There was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughter of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. In a time of religious corruption and power plays by the Pharisees and Sadducees, Zechariah and Elizabeth are like a breath of fresh air. They are described as righteous and blameless. Unfortunately, they're advanced in years and have no children, but this changes suddenly and miraculously when the angel Gabriel shows up and tells Zechariah that his wife is going to have a child, a son, a powerful prophet who will prepare the way for Jesus. You know what? Priests don't believe in angels. So it shouldn't surprise us that when Zechariah sees an angel, that he is stunned, that he's shocked by this. He can't believe what's happening. And when he questions the news, the angel actually responds to him this way, Oh, here's your sign, Zechariah. You won't be able to speak until the child is born. Really? Zechariah has this amazing experience and yet he can't tell anybody about it. Huh, you think God has a sense of humor? Elizabeth, however, seems to be a bit quicker to believe the news. And when she becomes pregnant, she says this. We hear about it in verse 25. Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when He looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now with child, Elizabeth goes into seclusion for the first five months of her pregnancy. And so maybe this has a little bit to do with her disgrace, that reproach that Luke talks about. For her, the inability to have children is certainly a source of pain, sorrow, and shame. Having children is a big deal in that culture. The hope of the couple fades through the years as they are repeatedly shunned having a child. Maybe she experienced miscarriages. Maybe there was infertility involved. Whatever the case is, her self-worth deteriorates as the years pass 
and her hope dims. At some point, she and everyone around her declare Elizabeth barren and brand her with this stigma. And so maybe this is why she sought seclusion for five months. Maybe she wanted to keep this hope so that eventually it would blossom into joy. Maybe she wanted to ensure the pregnancy is going to last. Maybe she simply just wanted to savor these days on her own terms. And then it happens again. Something incredible happens again. In Elizabeth's sixth month of pregnancy, Gabriel makes another earthly appearance. And this time it's to Mary. He delivers the most miraculous pregnancy announcement of all. And so how does Mary respond to this? She receives it gracefully and willingly. But at some point, I'm sure Mary realizes the challenges and disgrace that will follow. And so the scorn and shame that she will face, along with her family and her fiancé, it will be tremendous. Especially when it becomes obvious that she is pregnant and unmarried. So how do you convince people to believe that the baby in your womb just happens to be God's son? I mean, even Joseph can't believe the news at first. Matthew's narrative tells us that he plans to break off the engagement, which in the culture at that time is equivalent to getting a divorce. So Mary's journey is not going to be an easy one. Maybe that's why Luke tells us in verse 39, In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. Want to get away? Yeah, Mary wants to get away. And then Mary hears about Elizabeth's miraculous pregnancy. And maybe she concludes to herself, if anyone's going to understand what's going on in my life, it's going to be Elizabeth. And she would be right thinking that way. This is where joy erupts against the backdrop of disgrace, grief, and even shame. And so joy characterizes these expectant mothers, Luke tells us in verse 41. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Could you imagine the relief that Mary experiences when she meets with Elizabeth? I mean, really. She doesn't have to worry anymore about being misunderstood. She doesn't have to explain herself. All she has to do is show up, knock on the door, say hello, and Elizabeth understands. And the baby inside Elizabeth leaps for joy within her. This is the affirmation and the encouragement that Mary needs. And so Mary now erupts with her own joy as she speaks words of praise and thanksgiving to God. We pick it up in verse 46. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for He has looked on the humble estate of His servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed, for He who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is His name. And His mercy is for those who fear Him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with His arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich He has sent away empty. He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. You see, this beautiful passage of Scripture reveals a celebration in the midst of miraculous events. I can just imagine Mary and Elizabeth sitting in their nursery, 
pondering what color they're going to choose, what theme they're going to have as they ponder the events that took place and as they ponder the events that will take place. I can only imagine the joy in their heart as they have that conversation. But it also shows that these two expectant mothers share that deep understanding and affirmation that actually fosters an eruption of joy despite what has already happened and even despite what is about to happen. You know, I think there's much that we can take away from this story, but I'd like to focus on three truths that we can apply to our own experience of joy. And the first truth is simply this. It's good to be joyful, even happy. You see, the Bible doesn't make any distinction between joy and happiness. They're essentially the same thing. They're just different words for the same thing. They may have slightly different nuances, like a lot of synonyms actually do, but they're mostly cultural in nature. The original Hebrew and Greek terms used in the Bible to describe joy and happiness are essentially interchangeable. And this is one of the premises of a book called Happiness by the theologian um, Randy Alcorn. We need to hear that it's good to be joyful. We need to hear that it's good to be happy. There is great joy in the Christmas season. And it's good to embrace it and to celebrate it. Now I understand it can be hard to fight the discouragement. I mean, we have to fend it off if we're going to savor and experience joy. For those of you who find yourself driven by obligation or duty or busyness, maybe guilt right now during this season, please understand me. It's okay to stop. It's okay to say no. You can pause and you can embrace the part of the season that actually brings you joy and happiness. To those of you who see Christmas as painful, maybe it's a difficult season for you. I know many years ago, I lost my father the day after Christmas. So there is a little bit of pain and difficulty with this season for me. To those of you who are hurting and grieving personally, or maybe feeling discouraged because of the tumultuous year that we've experienced, or maybe those of you who have found happiness in the midst of this season, it's good to embrace joy. It's good to embrace the happiness. It's a natural desire that God has placed within us and it's also a reflection of His own joyful nature. I mean, whatever term we want to use, the important part is to remember our source of joy and happiness, which leads me to my second truth today. Joy is our strength. It is our strength. And there's a great example of this principle in the story of Nehemiah. You remember Nehemiah, that he was an Old Testament leader who received permission from King Artaxerxes to return from exile in Babylon and rebuild the city of Jerusalem, starting with its walls. The process was more than just a return to a physical city. It was a spiritual reawakening for the people. And so in chapter 8 of the book, Nehemiah brings all the people together. They bring out the law of Moses and they read it. And Nehemiah calls the people to remember and to return to their relationship with God. And as he does this, the people weep. Now why in the world would they weep about this? Maybe they are tears of joy that come for those who remember God's words from years past. Or maybe the weeping comes from sadness. Sadness as they recognize their sin and guilt. Here's the beauty in the midst of the scene. Nehemiah speaks to the people. We read about it in verse 10 of Nehemiah 8. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. Celebrate it. Enjoy it. This is what Nehemiah tells them. Why? Because it's a time for happiness. God has brought you back. God is restoring your city 
and He's restoring your heart. You see, our strength, our strength is the joy of the Lord. It fuels us and it sustains us. And even now, our source of happiness and joy and fulfillment is Jesus Christ. So Christmas can be a season of joy because the Messiah provides us the way of ultimate fulfillment in life. And I think Peter hits the nail on the head. 1 Peter 1, 8 and 9. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. Though you do not now see Him, you believe in Him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. That inexpressible joy, well, that just sounds amazing, doesn't it? It sounds like deep stuff. And it is deep, because it's deeper than our pain, or our sorrow, or any problem that may burden us right now. It is deep, and it is a well that we can draw upon, no matter what we are facing. Now, I'm not suggesting that we go around and put on a fake smile, that plastic smile, and just fake it. That's not what I'm saying. That's not the kind of joy I'm talking about. Sometimes, our joy, it can be a rushing fountain erupting from deep within us. But I also realize that our joy simply may be a slow bubble that just simmers to the surface. Wherever you find yourself, let me encourage you let me encourage you that the joy of the Lord can be experienced no matter what we face. And this leads to our final truth today. We must choose joy. We have to choose it. Rejoice is not a word that we use much in our culture now, and maybe we should. Rejoice is the verb form of the word joy. It's experiencing and expressing joy, and delight. And when we look at that word, we'll notice that it begins with a prefix, re. This prefix means once more or to return to. To rejoice is to return to joy. It's a choice we make. It's an action that we take to return to joy. It is a return to Jesus, really, who is our source of joy. So to rediscover Christmas is to rediscover joy. And this is why the prefix, re, is so important. We must return to joy regularly, daily even, constantly. We return to Jesus, our source of joy. And so rejoicing becomes that process of refueling our tank, of restoring our strength, of renewing our spirits. It's something that reconnects us to our Savior. And it's in this process that the words of the Apostle James make sense. He encourages us in the first chapter of his letter. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Now this is probably the last thing that we want to hear when we're hurting. I mean, joy seems so far away from us when we're grieving, when we're depressed or afraid, and as our problems and pain loom behind us. James doesn't say, be happy about your trials and problems. He says, that we can find joy in them. And we do that when we dig deeper and we see the bigger picture. You see, God wants to grow us and He wants to mature us to make us more like His Son, Jesus. And the trials, well, that's what He uses to make that happen. So let me share this other thought with you this morning. Joy will erupt as we follow the Spirit of Jesus. I mean, really, what's the second word in the fruit of the Spirit? You have love, and then you have what? You have joy. You understand to walk in the Spirit is to walk in joy. 
I think joy is evidence of someone who celebrates and appreciates life with God the Father through Jesus Christ in the power and presence of Holy Spirit. Now maybe this time of the year, this season of the year, certainly we can find joy in our faith, right? The faith in the the child who was born, the faith in Jesus who goes to the cross and saves us from our sins, who raises from the dead. Certainly faith is a reason for our joy, but maybe family is too. And maybe the feast that we'll be enjoying, we don't need to feast every day, but there certainly are times that we can enjoy a good meal. And maybe we take joy in the future, knowing that there's this bright new heaven and new earth that we're going to be spending with Christ for eternity. You see, joy is the trademark. It is the trademark of someone who trusts Jesus Christ and walks in the Spirit. Our vision statement of Bartonville Christian Church is engaging the world with God's love as equipped and empowered followers of Christ. Our love of God is displayed in our joy, not our bitterness. Our love of others springs from a heart of joy, not resentment. And so the death, burial, resurrection, and enthronement of Jesus, it is our source of joy because we know when we pledge allegiance to Him that we have eternal life with Him in the new heaven and the new earth. And we love as we make disciples. We are encouraging others to move closer to God, encouraging them to pledge allegiance to Jesus, to be baptized into His name, to confess Him as Lord and Savior, and to repent of their sinfulness, and then to live and to love as Jesus did. Let me offer these two reminders to you as we wrap this up today. The first reminder is this. Let's experience the joy of our salvation. You see, we find encouragement in the book of Psalms, particularly Psalm 13. It is a great example. And yet it begins with a painful cry. Maybe you've heard yourself saying these words before. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Sometimes God doesn't feel like He's present. Sometimes He feels distant like he doesn't care, like he isn't around. But I'm intrigued intrigued that the end of the psalm, Psalm 13, 5, ends with this declaration. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. We can rejoice now, like the psalmist, because God saves humanity through Jesus Christ. Do we trust God's love for us? When's the last time that we stopped and acknowledged and experienced the joy of being saved by Christ's sacrifice? In what ways are you leading others to experience this joy along with you? The second reminder I want to leave you with. Let's experience the joy of our sanctification. You see, God saves us in Christ just as we are, wretched sinners. But He doesn't want to keep us just as we are, people who are enslaved to sin. Sanctification is Holy Spirit's work in us, making us holy, setting us apart from the world, and making us more like Jesus. Paul says something about this in his letter to the Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Acacia. You catch that? Amid affliction, the early church experienced the joy of the Holy Spirit. How did they experience this joy? They received the Word of God. When's the last time you experienced joy simply in receiving the Word of God? And more than that, they imitated godly people as they imitated the Lord. And why did they do this? In order to set an example for other believers. (laughs) That begs the question, what example 
are we giving to other people? Are we submitting to the flesh? Are we participating in gluttony and greed? Are we materialistic and bitter? Are we engaging in immorality and malice? Or are we walking in the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. Yes, we can remain stuck. We can remain stuck following the flesh. But remaining stuck, we are going to be frustrated. Or we, be, we can become more like Jesus. And that's where joy is truly found, walking in the Spirit. So let's rediscover Christmas this year by embracing joy, no matter what we are going through. Let's remember each day the source of our joy and constantly return to it. Let's choose to continue the process of rejoicing despite the pain and challenges that we face. Let's heed the good news of the angels that will bring great joy to all people. A Savior has been born, our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, and He will carry us through and complete His work in us no matter what life throws at us. Heavenly Father, we do come to You and we are grateful that You've given us a reason to be joyful, given us a reason to be happy. And we know that we are burdened and we know that we experience pain and frustration, the disappointment and the discouragement that life throws at us. But that's not all there is. There's a greater story, there's a bigger picture, and there's a greater work in and through us. And we are grateful for Jesus, and we're grateful for His Spirit, and I pray that You would help us to walk in this Spirit, to set an example for others, and to lead them into the kingdom, so that all of us together can follow the Lamb into the new heaven and the new earth. That brings me joy right now, as I anticipate that joyful moment when all of us People from every tribe and every language and every nation will be gathered together in your presence forever. How joyful that is going to be. May we rejoice in this reality. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. wondering this Christmas season if you are experiencing some of the same feelings that I've been feeling. Feelings of being fragmented, disconnected, occasionally frustrated, and sometimes 
a little bit angry. Sometimes I get so busy doing things for God that I forget to take time to be with God. One of my favorite contemporary Christmas songs is Mary Did You Know? I wondered if Mary had some of these same feelings as she drew near to giving birth to God's son. She was pregnant. She was miserable. She was being taken away from her family and friends all by a decree from a Roman Empire emperor. She had traveled far to give birth to the Messiah in a stable to fulfill the prophecy of Micah 5.2. And just when she needed some rest and the baby was sleeping, suddenly there in the stable was a bunch of noisy, smelly shepherds. And they were babbling something about angels appearing to them and singing glory to God in the highest and telling them that they should run to Bethlehem to find the Messiah. And yet, in Luke 2, 19, it says that Mary pondered all these things and she treasured them in their heart. I'm sure she wondered, what, what could all of this mean? And as the song says, when she kissed the baby's face, did she know that she was kissing the face of God? John 1, 1, 14 is one of my favorite verses. It says that Jesus left heaven and the word became flesh and dwelt among men. The translation, the message says that Jesus tabernacled or he moved in on our street to live with us. God became human and walked among us. He became a man. Did Mary know that when she held the baby Jesus that she was holding the perfect Lamb of God who would take away the sins of the world? And yet, I reflect this Christmas time, we cannot think about Christmas unless we think about the death of Jesus. Mark Lowry, who wrote Mary Did You Know, said that Jesus never asked us to remember his birth, but he asked us to remember his death. Because through his death, we found life. As we come to this time of communion, remember Jesus, God's perfect son, the perfect lamb who has taken away the sins of the world by his death on the cross. As you drink this juice and eat this bread this morning, remember this Christmas, the wonderful gift that God gave us, the gift of forgiveness of sin and the gift of eternal life.